What would happen to the sun if a black hole were inside it? Sounds like the title of some clickbait pseudo-scientific video for the impressionable. But in reality, it's a quite serious question that many scientists consider. In December 2023, a group of scientists from Germany, the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Netherlands published a paper in the Astrophysical Journal specifically dedicated to modeling what would happen to a star with a black hole at its center, how it would look, and how it might differ from ordinary stars. This is not just some abstract theoretical pondering. It's an interesting topic that poses important questions for observational astronomy and astrophysics the answers to which could affect some of our fundamental understandings of the structure of the universe around us. By the way, among other things, the study concluded that a black hole could potentially exist even inside our own sun. How could this be? Subscribe to the channel and let's delve into it. It might seem that stars with a black hole at their center cannot exist for an indefinite amount of time. It is known that a black hole, thanks to its colossal gravity, absorbs any surrounding matter. So at first glance, it's logical to assume that a black hole would simply swallow all the sun's or another star's matter, resulting in an increased mass black hole. And that's it. For regular astrophysical black holes with a mass of several solar masses, this would generally look like that. However, many modern physicists believe that, in addition to black holes of stellar mass around 10 to 30 kilograms, and supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies with masses around 10 to 36 to 10 to 40 kilograms, there could also exist so-called microscopic black holes with masses ranging from a millionth, billionth, to even a trillionth of the sun's mass, up to black holes with masses around 10 to 11 kilograms. And if such a microscopic black hole were to be at the center of the sun or any other star, this system could exist in a relatively stable state for millions or even billions of years. It's easy to understand that there is a certain limit to the rate at which a black hole can absorb matter depending on its mass. It's somewhat akin to water flowing through a drain in a bathtub or sink. Matter rushes towards the opening but cannot pass through it all at once. Here, we essentially have the same thing, but the diameter of the drain opening is truly minuscule. The size, or more precisely, the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole with a mass of around 10 to power of 11 kilograms would be about 10 to the power of minus 16 meters, or 100 million times smaller than the diameter of a hydrogen atom. If such a black hole were at the center of a star like our sun, it would only absorb a fraction of a gram of its mass per second. And although the rate of mass absorption would increase as the black hole grows, over the 10 to 12 billion years allocated to our sun, such a black hole would only manage to consume about 100 million kilograms of its substance. For comparison, the solar wind carries about 4 billion kilograms of solar material into space every second. And against these natural losses, the damage that such a black hole would inflict on the sun would be completely insignificant. So yes, there might indeed be a tiny black hole hiding inside our sun, but we may never find out about it. However, speculating about what could be when we cannot verify it is considered counterproductive in physics, and scientists are more interested in black holes that can affect stars at their centers. For example, black holes with a mass of around 10 to 19 kilograms, roughly the mass of large asteroids, such black holes, with sizes on the order of tens of nanometers, similar to the sizes of large molecules or small viruses, absorb matter much more actively, up to a million kilograms per second. In the early stages of a star's evolution, even these black holes apparently will hardly manifest themselves. But as they grow over time, their influence on the star's physics will become more and more noticeable. After approximately four to five billion years, when the star reaches an age roughly equivalent to the current age of our sun, the mass of the black hole will have grown to around 10 to a 23 kilograms, roughly the mass of Mercury. Such a black hole would have a size on the order of a tenth of a millimeter, similar to the size of a grain of sand, and would be capable of absorbing up to a trillion kilograms of solar material every second. While this is still very little compared to the colossal size of the sun, which has a mass of about 10 to 30 kilograms, 
the impact of such an object on the processes in the core of our star would no longer be negligible. To understand how a tiny black hole can influence the physics of a giant plasma ball, which is the sun, it's worth revisiting our analogy with water draining in a bathtub. We all know that the matter rushing towards the drain doesn't move straight to it, but instead starts spiraling, forming a vortex. Something very similar happens with the matter being pulled into a black hole. We can observe similar processes in the vicinity of ordinary black holes, creating spiral vortices that draw in surrounding matter. In the inner regions of these cosmic funnels, called accretion disks, the matter moves significantly faster than in the outer regions. Between the outer and inner layers of the matter moving toward the center of the vortex, viscous friction occurs, heating them up, sometimes to millions of degrees. Like any heated substance, the matter in the accretion disk begins to emit thermal electromagnetic radiation, both in the visible spectrum and its invisible ranges, including X-rays and gamma rays. The giant accretion disks of supermassive black holes at the centers of some galaxies shine so brightly that their luminosity can surpass the combined luminosity of all stars in a galaxy like ours by hundreds of times. These objects are known as quasars. In fact, quasars emit light thanks to the conversion of the gravitational energy of the falling matter into thermal energy and then into electromagnetic radiation. The efficiency of this conversion is remarkably high. The energy emitted by accretion disks can be equivalent to up to 30% of their mass. For comparison, in the process of nuclear fusion of helium from hydrogen in the core of the sun, only about 0.7% of the involved mass is transformed into energy. In other words, although a black hole absorbs everything that falls into it without a trace, the matter it engulfs releases and radiates a significant amount of energy before being consumed. A similar energy release occurs when a black hole absorbs the matter of a star at its center. However, this conversion is not as efficient as in the case of disk accretion. Here, the efficiency is roughly around 1%. Nevertheless, even with this efficiency, a black hole at the center of a star can produce an amount of energy comparable to what the star generates through nuclear fusion, converting hydrogen in its core into helium. In simpler terms, a star with a black hole at its center ends up having two sources of energy, nuclear fusion and matter accretion onto the black hole. Moreover, while the nuclear furnace of the star operates at approximately constant power, increasing energy production by about 1% every 100 million years, the black hole reactor becomes more intensive as the black hole increases its mass, more precisely, proportional to the square of the black hole's mass. Roughly six to seven billion years after the birth of the star, when the black hole at its center reaches a mass on the order of Uranus's mass, i.e. about 10 to the power of 25 kilograms and becomes roughly the size of an orange, the black hole's energy output will equal that of nuclear reactions and then surpass them. At this stage, such a hybrid of a star and a black hole, these objects are also called Hawking stars, already significantly differs from an ordinary star of the same mass and age. The radiation produced by the black hole creates additional pressure, inflating the star's core from the inside, causing both the core and the star as a whole to noticeably increase in size. According to calculations, our sun, for example, would increase in size by about four to five times as a result of this process. From a thermodynamic point of view, the substance of the sun and stars, in general, is most similar to gas, and just like any gas, it cools when expanded. Therefore, due to expansion under the influence of the energy emitted by the black hole, the star will reduce its temperature, leading to the complete cessation of nuclear reactions in its core for approximately the next billion years. Accretion of the star's matter onto the black hole will remain the only source of its energy. By this point, the black hole inside the star will have grown to approximately 10 to 27 kilograms, representing roughly a tenth of a percent of the mass of a star similar to our sun. One might expect that the now engorged black hole would start consuming the star's matter at an accelerating pace, and now we would finally witness what we expected to see from the very beginning, the rapid consumption of the star by the black hole. However, astrophysics has a surprise in store for us even here. 
Above, we mentioned that the radiation from a black hole creates excess pressure on the substance of the star. And this pressure will, in a way, push the star's material, leading to its expansion. Well, at a certain stage, this pressure will become significant enough to noticeably hinder further absorption of the star's material by the black hole. In simpler terms, the rates at which the black hole devours the star will significantly slow down, and the star will be able to exist in the described state for another billion years. At this stage, we, following the authors of the article with which we started our narrative, can attempt to compare the evolution of a regular star with a mass on the order of our sun's mass and a Hawking star of the same mass with a black hole at its center with an initial mass on the order of 10 to 19 kilograms. Initially, stars will live and evolve almost identically and up to an age of approximately four to five billion years, which is the current age of the sun, the black hole will practically not manifest itself from the perspective of an external observer. However, the Hawking star will then relatively quickly increase in size under the pressure of the black hole's radiation, cooling in the process. By the time both stars are around 10 billion years old, the Hawking star will be about four to five times larger than a normal star and will have a temperature of approximately 4,500 degrees Celsius compared to about 6,000 degrees for a regular star, ultimately emitting about 10 times more energy than its normal counterpart. The process of its expansion will continue albeit relatively slowly due to reaching a certain balance between gravity and radiation. Around this time, a regular star will have burned through its hydrogen reserves in its core, and its nuclear reactions fueled by hydrogen will be depleted. Just as the increase in energy production, as seen earlier, leads to expansion and cooling of the star, its reduction will lead to compression and heating. At a certain stage of this process, the temperature in the core of a regular star will rise to about 80 million degrees, a temperature at which helium, accumulated by the star in the previous stage of its evolution, can become fuel for nuclear reactions. Helium nuclear burning is accompanied by much greater energy release than the synthesis of helium from hydrogen. As we already know, when a star begins to receive more energy than before, it expands in size and decreases in temperature. According to calculations, in the case of the sun, its radius will increase by about 150 times compared to its current size. And the temperature, conversely, will decrease to about 3200 degrees. This transformation is called the transition to the red giant stage, where the star will spend approximately one and a half billion years, after which its helium reserves will also be depleted. The star, shedding its outer shell, will compress into a small and hot drop of matter, a white dwarf, completing its evolution approximately 12 billion years after birth. While a regular star undergoes all these dramatic evolutions, the Hawking star will slowly increase in size as the black hole absorbs more and more of its mass until it is finally completely engulfed and transforms into a black hole approximately 15 billion years after its formation. And all of this looks quite beautiful and logical, but this theory has one small annoying problem. No one has ever seen a black hole with masses less than the mass of the sun, which is required for the formation of Hawking stars. The least massive black hole known to scientists at the moment is located in the V616 Monocerotis system and has a mass on the order of three solar masses. In fact, according to current understanding, Black holes with a mass less than about 2.2 solar masses cannot form within the generally accepted mechanism of gravitational collapse of the most massive stars at the end of their evolution. However, it is not excluded that in nature there exists, or more accurately, existed, another mechanism for the formation of black holes. So-called primordial black holes, born not as a result of the death of a star, but long before the appearance of any stars at all, in the first moments after the Big Bang. As is known, only one thing is essentially needed for the formation of a black hole, matter compressed to a sufficiently high density. In the first moments after the Big Bang, the average density of the universe was slightly less than this critical density. Emphasize, we are talking about the average density, while at any specific point in the early universe, this density could be significantly lower 
or significantly higher than average, including being sufficiently high to lead to the formation of many primordial black holes of various masses. The smallest of them were expected to evaporate relatively quickly due to Hawking radiation, but those primordial black holes that had a mass on the order of 10 to 11 kilograms and larger could survive until the beginning of the epoch of star formation. It is not excluded that the multitude of primordial black holes of various masses is the elusive dark matter that scientists worldwide have been searching for for many decades. Unfortunately, without success, however, can we be certain that primordial black holes formed in the early universe? Unfortunately, we cannot know for sure until we detect at least one microscopic black hole, and doing so is not that simple. The issue is that black holes are, by definition, invisible, as they do not emit or reflect light, making them practically impossible to detect through classical methods. Supermassive black holes can be detected through the electromagnetic radiation emitted by their accretion disks. Black holes of stellar masses are usually identified through their influence on visible cosmic objects, such as stars. Under fortunate circumstances, a black hole can be detected through gravitational lensing, where the gravitational field of the black hole bends the light rays coming from objects located behind it toward the Earth observer. Unfortunately, for black holes of small masses, all these effects are too weak for us to detect them at arbitrarily large distances. There are even hypotheses that a small, around 10 to 25 kilograms, black hole might exist somewhere on the outskirts of the solar system, and its influence could cause some anomalies in the orbits of trans-Neptunian objects that we observe but cannot explain. So, Hawking stars, hybrids of a regular star and a miniature black hole, interest astronomers primarily because their discovery would confirm the existence of primordial black holes of small masses. This, in turn, would allow us to close a certain gap in our understanding of the structure of both the early and modern universe. In general, it's an important, necessary, and interesting matter. All we need to do now is find Hawking stars in the vastness of space. Earlier, we mentioned how Hawking stars would differ from regular stars. They would start expanding and reddening slightly earlier than stars of their mass should but they would do so significantly less than regular stars during the process of turning into red giants. In simpler terms, mature Hawking stars should be larger and cooler, hence redder than regular stars of the same mass, but smaller and hotter than red giants. The good news is that as of today, we know about 50 stars that look exactly like this. They are the so-called sub-subgiants and red stragglers. Unfortunately, we cannot confidently say that all these stars are indeed Hawking stars, as there are other hypothetical mechanisms for the formation of stars with such characteristics. However, the likelihood that at least some of these stars do have a black hole at their center is there, and further research is needed to understand whether this is the case. Definitively distinguishing a Hawking star from a regular star is possible by studying its neutrino flux, formed as a result of nuclear reactions in its core. We know fairly accurately how many neutrinos are produced in such reactions, so by measuring the neutrino flux, we can accurately calculate the energy generated in the nuclear furnace of a specific star. For example, the sun emits precisely the amount of neutrinos it should, and thus the likelihood of having a noteworthy black hole inside our star tends toward zero. Unfortunately, we are not yet able to measure neutron fluxes coming from other stars. Therefore, the hunt for Hawking stars requires other tricks, one of which is currently actively considered, astroseismology. Just as studying the propagation of seismic waves through the Earth's interior has allowed us to learn much about the structure of the Earth's depths, similarly, studying the propagation of similar waves in stellar material can help us peek into their interiors and in particular, find out whether there are black holes there or not. However, the topic of astroseismology is interesting in itself, even unrelated to Hawking stars, so we might dedicate a separate video to this question.